Um, thank you, everybody. Yeah, so this uh, Future of Humanity Institute, maybe I should just say a couple of words what the heck that is. It's uh, a group of about 20 people. Um, we're some mathematicians, computer scientists, and philosophers. And um, we're trying to think carefully about um, what the future might bring, especially the deep future, and how technology might transform the human condition. <clears throat> so um, a big focus of ours has been the future of uh, AI and machine intelligence, which is what I will talk to you about today. Um, now, when we think about smart machines, we might think all these kind of cool gadgets that are on the horizons, better smartphone assistants, virtual realities, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all of that is coming, and it's going to be great. But I was asked today to try to uh, talk about the big picture questions. And so if you ask me to talk about the big picture, I'm going to talk big picture. So. Um, so so that, that, that kind of stuff there on the monitor uh, is not going to be the focus of my talk, but rather what the ultimate ramifications might be of this um, transition to the machine intelligence era. Um, so let's just take a little glimpse back at what has happened so far in human history. And you could argue that there have really only been two events in all of human history that have made a fundamental change to the human condition. There have been a lot of wars and earthquakes and plagues, um, but... But if you were to plot, say, the global population or average happiness or average income population size, there have been kind of two pivotal moments that have changed the basic rules of the game. The first being the agricultural revolution, when we learned to domesticate crops and animals, we settled down, you could have villages and then cities, you could have social stratification because with grains you could expropriate surpluses, you could have a king or pharaoh with a lot of underlings, you had the invention of writing, you could have tax collection, you could have wars between nations, a whole host of things changed with the, human con with, with the agricultural revolution. And from then on, the pace of further development accelerated rapidly. We had been hunter-gatherers for 100,000 years pr previously, and all the rest happened in the 10,000 years since this first significant event. The second being the industrial revolution, where for the first time, the rate of technological innovation and economic productivity growth became so rapid that population growth couldn't keep pace. Before that, there had been a lot of economic growth, a lot of technological innovation, but any time the economy became 10% more productive, the population grew 10% as well, so average income stayed the same. And only with industrial revolution do you get an escape from the Malthusian condition. Um, now, how big will the transition to this machine intelligence era be? Well, I would argue that it possibly could be bigger than either of those preceding technological revolutions. We might have to go back to the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place um, to find some kind of parallel. If you think about it, all the discovery, all the organization, all the invention, all the entrepreneurship that made the agricultural and the industrial revolution possible were made possible by the human brain. It's kind of the birth canal through which all ideas, all technologies have had to pass. So if at some point you discover a radically different substrate from which further innovation can happen, and if that happens on digital timescales, then, then you have a fundamental, a very fundamental change um, in the rules of the game. You could argue that you might have an even bigger shift if you think about it. The, um, the transition from the great ape ancestors of humanity to Homo sapiens, um, involved some relatively small changes in neural architecture. And we know that they're relatively small because they happen quite quickly in evolutionary time. And there was some scaling up as well of the cortex. You get maybe three times larger brain. Um, but the leap to a, a technologically mature civilization with machine intelligence that has reached its technological limits could just be vastly bigger. Like the, a computer doesn't have to fit inside a skull. It could be the size of a warehouse or larger. There's no limit, really. Um, the, if, if you look at the basic components of the human brain, the nerve cell fires at 100 hertz per second. At, at 100 hertz, 100 times per second. But um, even current day transistors uh, operate at the gigahertz, a billion times per second. And, and uh, signal conductivity in, in, in human nerve cells you know, maxes out at about 100 meters per second down the, down the spine. 
but in computers, signals can travel at the speed of light. So, so there are these fundamental reasons to think that ultimately, although we are very far from it right now, but ultimately the potential for information processing in machine substrates are just vastly greater than those in biological tissue. Um, so then we can expect this uh, to happen soon. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but let, let us ask, um, if we set aside these depictions um, in Hollywood movies and science fiction stories where, where the future is normally a subject that is merely used as a kind of projection screen for, for current fears and hopes and to tell stories about human characters, really. But what if we actually are interested in the future for its own sake, because we're interested in what it will be, we're, if we actually try to get correct beliefs about the future? Let, let's, it's, it's a hard topic, but let, let's just see what, how one might start to approach that. So, so what, one place one can begin is just by doing very simple opinion survey. Uh, you select according to some metric, who might have the most expertise in the area of machine intelligence. We did a survey uh, last year where we sampled from um, AI experts, a uh, contributed author at the key leading technical uh, machine learning conferences. Um, and we asked them a number of questions, one of which was this. Um, let's define high-level machine intelligence as basically AI that can accomplish every task better and more cheaply than human workers. Um, and let, let's, let's assume that human civilization won't collapse due to nuclear war, but like that kind of things basically continue. Then how long will it take until we have such high level, you can think human level, uh, machine intelligence? And so um, depending on precisely which groups of experts we ask, you get slightly different answers, but they are broadly consistent. Um, and you can see here, for example, that if we ask by what by what year is there a 25% probability? Um, if, we, if we take this green line, that's one group of experts. You can see that the median estimate was that in about 25 years, there is a 25% chance of this coming to pass. So in 25 years, that's within the, uh, the working life of, of a lot of you, you're a fairly youthful audience. Um, maybe by the time you retire, there is at least a one in, in four chance of, of this this coming to pass. And obviously the probability goes up over time. And there is some chance that it could happen much sooner. Um, we can ask uh, slightly different questions to try to get at, at, at the same issue and, and you get answers that are broadly consistent with that. Um, one survey we did previously suggested that there is a 50% probability by the year 2040-2045 that we might have achieved this. But there is great uncertainty because really nobody knows. Um, so you should not sort of either think it will happen or won't happen, but you think of a probability distribution smeared out over a wide range of possible arrival dates. <clears throat> and, and that's about as far as we can go. We should recognize these are just a subjective opinions. There's no, no, no science which can deduce when this kind of thing will happen. But it's not the case. That's the one thing we can conclude from this service. It's not the case that the hypothesis that this could happen, like in our lifetime, is like a crazy hypothesis that nobody believes or actually knows this stuff. In, in fact, it's, it's the median opinion in the field. Um, so, so this might be a little puzzling depending on, on your um, sort of previous exposure, what, what your associations are with AI. Um, if we look back, the whole field really has only existed for a few decades. I mean, we didn't have computers until, to, to speak of until sort of the Second World War. And the field of artificial intelligence really was started only in 1956 when there was a big conference that's kind of usually taken to be the starting date. Um, and, and in the early days, there was a lot of um, high expectations for what might happen. The pioneers thought they might have this cracked within 10 years or so. Uh, it turned out the problem of really building machines that can think in the same way as we do uh, is a lot harder than, than these pioneers had hoped and believed. Uh, and so they followed on this early excitement uh, a period of disillusionment, the, the first AI winter where um, AI became almost a dirty word. Like you didn't want to brand your company AI. You didn't want to say that you were doing AI research. You would call it something different because it became associated with hype um, and, and, uh, and, and failed uh, delivery. And then there was a second wave of excitement uh, coming roughly in the 70s and 80s. Uh, um, and, and again, there was a new sort of bubble of high expectations. Uh, which also deflated, and that was the second AI winter when funding dried up. Um, and that, now we're kind of in the third spring. There is now this 
again, renewed sense of great optimism potential, the sense that things are on the move. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what has happened recently and, and what, what the excitement is all about. Um, so AI used to be really about this. Uh, you'd have a big database uh, with entries painstakingly uh, produced by sampling human experts and human programmers. We'd put them in knowledge piece by knowledge piece. And then the artificial intelligence really was just a simple mechanism that could draw simple logical conclusions from this. And you got out only what you put in. And, and these had some narrow uses, but these kind of expert systems were brittle. Uh, they didn't scale. Um, they were hard to keep updated. Really only useful for narrow domains. They didn't generalize. Um, AI also used to be good at these kind of logic -y things where you can explicitly write down the rules for how to solve a problem step by step. So this is, you, you might have played with one of these when you were kids, the Rubik's Cube. So something like this, AI used to be really good at and it still is, so, so check this. Uh, um, so, so that kind of thing has long been possible, but what's recently and only recently become possible is to have machines that can, um, that can see, that can have perception in something similar to the way that we humans can see the world around us. Not just sort of if A then B, A therefore B, but that can look uh, at an image which to the computer comes in just as a big table of numbers representing the uh, pixel brightnesses at different points. And then from that, form some form of conception of what this array of pixels represent. And this is roughly the state of the art as of uh, maybe a year ago or so. Um, and you can see that in many cases it does a pretty good job at spitting out text that describes what's in the picture. It's not, not perfect. But this was completely out of reach of, of AI um, even 10 years ago. Like it's just not something where you can write down an explicit set of rules for telling whether the pixels um, represent a cat or a dog. Like there are just so many different ways a dog could appear depending on the light and, and the angle and what kind of dog that it's just completely infeasible to write down the rules. You really need to have machines that can learn um, from experience, which is how this kind of performance is achieved. Um, you, you might think, well, didn't Google have like image search even going back like 10 years ago? Well, yes, they did, but it was done in a different way. So it used to be done by having the Google search engine see there's a page, there's an image, and then next to the image there's a caption with some words in it or something like that. So then you can guess that maybe that those words relate to the picture. But now what you can do is just show the picture and it can, um, can often tell what it is that is in it. And so the, the, the technology that makes this possible is called uh, deep learning. Um, so you have these deep neural network-like structures where uh, you train them with lots and lots of examples, usually hundreds of thousands or millions. And over time, these layers in the network build up. <clears throat> they, they figure out what the useful features uh, in the input data is. Uh, and deeper layers in the network tend to pick up on more abstract features. So maybe in the first layer, you get simple neurons that respond to, to corners or edges, simple patterns. And deeper layers, you might find neurons that respond to uh, part of an eye or the shape of a nose or something like that. Um, but nobody writes down the rules here. You just have this algorithm that is able to adjust the weights in this deep neural network uh, to gradually <clears throat> form better and better classifiers. <clears throat> um, we can also see that um, in, in style transfer that there is some sense in which current deep learning systems have the ability to form the intuition of, of, of style. So if you feed in <clears throat> a photograph and then a picture, a Picasso picture here, it can spit out the photograph rendered in the style of that painting. Uh, so to do this, again, you need to form some sort of sense of what the essence of the Picasso style is to then be able to apply it to the painting. Here, here's another example. You have a Van Gogh and a picture of a waterfall. And you know maybe it's not exactly Van Gogh, but you could certainly see that it's kind of captures the gist of it in some sense. Um, <clears throat> imagination also comes from these. So you can run these deep neural networks kind of in reverse. So you run them in one way, you get a classification out. But if you start 
with noise, um, you can kind of get the network to try to come up with its best interpretation of what is really on the noise, much like we do if we, if we look at a Rorschach test or, or, a, or a wall that just has splat, splatter on it. Like you might see a face in there. You can kind of read things in. Um, and so this was done a couple of years ago, and, and, and this is the typical specimen of, of these kind of hallucinations that the networks would spit out. It's kind of creepy, but they apparently had a training data with a lot of dog pictures and stuff like that. And you, you get, um, you can get locally, it kind of looks a bit dog-like. Now, it doesn't have much large-scale structure over the image, and it also doesn't know how to count, really, which is why you get, like, more than two eyes. Um, but but it's, it, it kind of hints at something. Um, more recently, and this was just um, published uh, about a month ago, there is the ability to do something like style transfer, but for moving images. Um, so you can see here that while it's looking at this picture of a horse, and given the word zebra, it kind of translates the picture into a zebra picture. And, and you can see that it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. If you look at the tail um, of the zebra, it's not quite there. But something like this is really do, impossible to do with, um, with like trying to specify in advance how to do it. You really need machine learning to achieve something like that. Uh, imagination is another um, area that has just recently become possible. So these are little video snippets dreamed up by deep neural networks reflecting on its conception of, of beach. And so you can see these are beach scenes. They are not 100% photorealistic, but they're certainly um, are, uh, evocative. And you could produce arbitrary numbers of these. You can just keep running it, and it like, generates an infinite number of these little beach scenes. Here is golf. Um, so it's just seen a lot of golf-like input, and uh, among other things, and, and it can then sort of dream up and imagine endless variations of that. Um, another area where um, rapid recent progress has been made is using reinforcement learning. So this is, so deep learning is kind of, the simplest way of using deep learning is to train up a classifier. And it kind of, the information goes in one way and comes out the other end. Like either imagining a picture or putting a label on a picture. Uh, what reinforcement learning tries to do is to train an agent end to end. So something that actually acts on the environment and then gets feedback. Um, so a couple of years ago, you probably most of you have seen this, uh, DeepMind Deep in Ollen published this um, program that could learn to play Atari games. So um, here is one um, that plays this simple game breakout after 100 training sessions. It's not very good, um, <laughs> but it, it gets better. Um, after 200 training examples, you can see it's a little bit less, less incompetent. So the interesting thing here is that, is that all it gets are raw pixels. Like, it's never told what the game is about. It gets the score, and it gets the raw pixels, and it gets the try. Now it's getting pretty good. This looks like human level. After 600 training examples, it discovers kind of the optimum strategy. So it's kind of cracked it. And um, the, uh, the, the impressive thing there is that this is trend and trained. So you have a simple learning algorithm. It's being fed these um, like images, like the, the video is a sequence of images. It gets the score, and it gets to try around different things initially just at random, but it kind of learns what works, and it does more of that. And the same algorithm that learns to play this, this breakout game can learn to play a whole host of other Atari games also right out of the box. So in itself, even in the olden days, it would have been easy to create a pro computer program that could play breakout. But what's interesting here is that the same computer program can learn to play uh, a wide range of different Atari games. Uh, more recently, and th this, is, this is work from the last year, um, the same kind of thing, a more advanced version of it, is learning to navigate more complex computer game environments like these 3D mazes. Um, so um, there's quite rapid music. You can also think of imagination. So far we talked about kind of sensory, like visual input, but the, the, same, the same algorithms, the same computational structures also apply to uh, hearing, and you can have computers dream up little music 
we'll see if this works with the, uh, it might not. Um, we don't hear anything, but I can tell you what it would sound like. Um, it would sound like, if you only listen to three or four seconds of it, uh, it would sound pretty good. Um, if you listen to longer sequence, like, like human music, if you listen to five, 10 seconds, you realize that it's kind of repetitive and meaningless and just meanders. So it doesn't have any sense yet of the compositional structure or, or meaning or emotional content, but for sh short snippets. It's like the analogous thing of those beach scenes or something like that. Um, um, so one research frontier is to try to combine these deep uh, learning systems and reinforcement learning systems with that, that are still struggling with doing some of the things that the old AI systems did well, namely uh, logical reasoning, um, discrete memory. So there are now attempts to try to give these um, neural networks auxiliary memory structures that they can read to and write to and then learn to use those memory structures training them with reinforcement learning to see if you can kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, there's some really exciting work there. And, and there's generally the sense that with these components, there's almost a Cambrian explosion. There's like a large set of possibilities that you can uh, um, try to reach towards by combining these building blocks in new ways and, and have kind of the different components rigged up in different ways. And um, a, a real sense of excitement of the field it is, is growing rapidly, these, these big technical conferences, like the, the one of these was where our survey took place a couple of years ago. They seem to be growing by maybe 40, 50% a year annually. There's just a burst of, of publications, a lot of funding streaming into this, um, a lot of companies trying to hire talent. So, so that, that's kind of the current sense of excitement in, in the field. I should also mention that some of this progress has been driven by improvements in hardware. Um, really, the deep learning revolution started when people figured out how to use GPUs, graphics processing units, um, to run these deep neural networks, which gave sort of an improvement of about 100x compared to running them on CPUs. Um, and, and right off the bat, it kind of became, you need a lot of compute to, to, to make these systems work. Um, and there are algorithmic tweaks as well. Okay, so what kind of applications can we see from this? Uh, like obvious things, robotics, uh, self-driving cars, uh, recommender systems that get better at figuring out what you want based on what other people have selected. Um, surveillance applications like with facial recognition and such. Um, autonomous weaponry. Um, in medicine, there are a lot of things from sort of looking at x-ray pictures to if you could get access to larger bodies of data of how different um, patients representing with different symptom, symptoms, like the different outcomes, you could imagine data mining that and finding patterns, um, virtual reality. Um, so, so all of those things um, are kind of pretty clearly uh, on, on the horizon, and there's going to be more and more over time. Um, and so we can answer this question now if, if I think, um, well, okay, so, so, so as we're moving in this general direction with these general purpose learning algorithms being developed as opposed to just specific solutions for specific problems. Um, it, the, the earlier survey I suggested, and I could say more of this in Q&A, suggests that we might at some point, although there's great uncertainty about the time scale, reach some kind of human equivalence. That is something that has the same powerful learning ability and planning ability and reasoning ability that, that makes us human smart. So if such human-level general AI is developed, then what are the likely outcomes? So uh, let, let me get to that by means of this little recent anecdotes of AlphaGo. I can just have a sip of even smart water. Yeah? <clears throat> so how many of you sort of followed or, or know about the Alf AlphaGo? Surprisingly few, a few maybe five, 10 percent. So, um, so, so Go is this board game that's been played for 3,000 years. Uh, it's a huge, it's almost an art form in Asia. It's much bigger in Asia than chess ever was in the West. Um, there are like maybe a thousand professional players who do nothing but just learn Go. Um, <clears throat> books written about it. Um, so um, a little over, a, well, maybe two years ago now, uh, DeepMind, the same company now by Google, started working on trying to apply some of their algorithms, this kind of same kind of algorithms that learn to play Atari, to this 
this game a go um, to see if they could make progress with that. And uh, in October 2015, they played <clears throat> with their then best system a kind of practice game um, against the, um, the European human go champion. Uh, and um, they set up uh, for the uh, 2016 a, a big championship match against like the, the, the greatest human go player at that point, the legend uh, Lee Sedol. So Lee Sedol uh, observed this, this practice match against the European champion in October and reflected that based on the level seen in that match, um, he thinks he'll win the game against AlphaGo by a near landslide. Because there's a huge difference between the best European player and the best player in the world. Like the Asia is just like way beyond in Go playing. It's like they've been working on this for 3,000 years. So there's like many levels of awesomeness between. Um, so um, in February, uh, just before the, uh, uh, the match, it, the best of five, the match was going to be. He's heard that Google's DeepMind's AI is surprisingly strong and getting stronger, but he's still confident he can win, at least this time. Maybe at some point in the future, it'll continue to improve it, but, uh, but this time. Uh, so then, after the first of the f for best of five, March 9, I was very surprised because I didn't think I would lose. I must have made a mistake. March 10, I lost the second game. I'm quite speechless. I'm in shock. I can admit that the third game is not going to be easy for me. It's kind of dawning on him that maybe, you know, he was overconfident. And then March 12th, uh, he lost the, the third one and, and the whole match, and he just said, I felt kind of powerless. Um, so the uh, moral of this little um, story that I want to bring out is that over uh, the period of half, half a year, no more, like six months, you have a system that went from being human level uh, to sort of being superhuman. And, and this was not obvious um, to the people who were like experts in this. So, so, so it, it suggests at least, I mean obviously it doesn't prove that this will happen with regard to general AI. This is like AI that is good at playing Go, but it suggests that maybe the transition um, in terms of general AI, it might also happen quite quickly, that this, this transition from roughly human level kind of being as good as the average competent human to surpassing us might, might not take that long. In this case, it took six months. Um, so I think people have this kind of view of, the, the, this is like intelligence to people. At the one end, you have the village idiot kind of bumbling along, being just generally a big fool. And then far away over at the other end here, like you have Einstein or Edward Witten or whoever your favorite sort of scientific Eber genius is. And, and there's this vast, vast ocean of, in between them. Um, and so you might think if this is your picture that you know, eventually p computers will reach there, but it'll take like a long, long time to get to cross, cross this divide. But I, I think the picture looks more like this. Um, you have the AI train starting here from this station in 1956 and then slowly rolling along the track maybe picking up a little speed as it goes along. But it takes a long time to get to mouse level intelligence, maybe something that can navigate the cluttered environment about as well as a mouse can and do conditioned learning, learn to navigate my, uh, mazes and such. It's kind of roughly where maybe we are approaching these days. And then it might take a lot of extra work to get to chimpanzee level AI. And then perhaps a lot of extra work from there to get to even a village idiot. Um, maybe the village idiot can talk you know, not, not, not very cleverly, but he can talk, he can drive a car, he can do some simple things. That might require a lot of extra work. And then, I don't think the AI train will stop at this humanville station here. Uh, I don't even think it will slow down. I think it will just swoosh right past. Um, so, so my answer to the question, if, if human level AI is developed, then what are the likely outcomes, um, is uh, super intelligence is the likely outcome. And uh, it, plausibly could happen fairly soon after human level AI is attained. Soon as in, you know, it might, might be days, it might be months, uh, years. I, I doubt that it would be decades. If, if and when you reach general human level AI that can do all the things that humans can do, I don't think it will then take decades to get beyond that. So then we can ask, like, what would the uh, consequences of superintelligence be? Um, so I think that that really 
will amount to not just one more kind of cool gadget or another nifty application, but, but really a, a, a fundamental discontinuity. It, as I suggested before, would be arguably the biggest thing that has happened in all of human history. It would be the transition to a whole new medium that will then impact everything else. So all f other areas of technological development and scientific research will then be done by this superintelligence much faster and much better than humans can do. Um, and so you shouldn't think of this as, oh, here's one more cool tool. Uh, but, but really, that's kind of where the, the human condition as we know it ends and some new condition starts. Um, and so, so one question that arises here that, that we have um, been doing some work on and some other groups uh, have as well is this uh, control problem. So if you, if you imagine that at, at some point you solve this question of how to write the algorithms that are really good at learning so you can get super intelligent. You could get machines to be really smart. How could you then control these really smart machines? If something is much smarter than you are, how could you ensure that it will do what you intend for it to do? How could you sort of predict what the outcome would be? Um, and uh, what, one way to kind of see what, 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 the, what the difficulty is there is, is, is when you, all these illustrations in, 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 the, in the myths and, and fables and stuff where somebody's granted like three wishes or a genie comes up and and, and they usually end uh, in tears. Like, it's, it's really difficult to wish wisely if, if you really could get what you want. So this is the King Maida. So he wished that everything he touches be turned into gold. And he became really rich because he could just make as much gold as he wants. And then he sits down and have his meal, and it turns into gold. Uh, he touches his daughter. She turns into gold. And what seemed like a good idea, actually, if you sort of follow out the logical implications, um, is an existential catastrophe. And what you often find in uh, optimization problems and in, even in, in current machine learnings is that if you specify an objective function and that you intend to capture the thing you care about, but you forget to include some aspect of what you care about, then often the omitted um, parameter values that you didn't f remember to bake into your objective specification are often set to extreme values when you're optimizing for what was actually in the specification. Um, and uh, in, in, in this literature on the AI control problem, this is often illustrated with a sort of cartoon example of the paperclip making AI. So the, the idea here is it's a cartoon example, but it sort of represents a much wider class of failure. So, so, so imagine that you built an AI and gave it the goal of making as many paperclips as possible. Maybe you wanted to run your paperclip factory. Um, and um, when, when the AI is weak, it works just as intended because the, the only way that the AI can make a lot of paper clips is by running this factory as efficiently as possible, which is just what you had in mind. But when the AI becomes smart enough, new strategies become available to it for how to make even more paper clips. Uh, it could try to seize control over other paper clip factories. It could uh, maybe develop, if it's super intelligent, new technologies for making paper clips, develop advanced molecular nanotechnology to transform the whole planet into paper clips. Uh, it would have an instrumental goal to prevent humans from switching it off, not because it kind of hates us or resents us, but just because it predicts that there will be fewer paper clips if we switch it off than not. Uh, and so you could then have the future light cone being kind of optimized for paper clip production. Uh, if the AI is sufficiently powerful and able to achieve its goal, that would seem to be the if, if, if the world were optimized for containing as many paper clips as possible, then it would not be a world with, with human habitats in it. It would just be paper clip factories everywhere. Um, and um, so, um, so what you want is scalable control. So, so right now, we don't really have any big trouble keeping our uh, artificial agents we have artificial agents like the one that played the Atari game, like other things that can operate on their own, but they're not really that hard to keep under control. But the control methods we rely on now that work perfectly fine for current systems are not scalable. That, that is, they are such that we can easily see that if you kept pouring on arbitrary amounts of intelligence and capability, at, at some point, that would very predictably uh, have these kind of perverse instantiations where they would suddenly start pursuing this constant goal in a very different way that would be detrimental to humans. So, so there's like a research field now that tries to develop these scalable control methods. Uh, and we can talk more about that if we have time at the end. Uh, so I wrote a book about this a few years 
ago, um, at, at, at which point this was a very neglected field. Um, but fortunately, it started to change. Um, and um, I, I actually, um, I have to take some risk. I mean, uh, I, I, I dwelled a lot on what could go wrong in the book because, not, not because I'm convinced that it will go wrong, but because I think it seemed more, more useful to have a very detailed understanding of exactly the specific ways in which things could go wrong so we can make sure to avoid them. Whereas it seemed to me we could get by with a fairly vague general sense of all the wonderful potential. Um, and then we can figure out later exactly how we use that as long as we sort of steer clear of the pitfalls. So I do, I do speak about the upside there, but most of the pages, if you just took the number of pages allocated to topic as mistaking that for my probability estimate of how likely that scenario was come to pass, you could think that it was, but I'm actually fairly optimistic that we will get the kind of outcome that we really want. Um, uh, no, no, I'm just, no, so I, but I, I think that, um, I, I, I think that if, if we zoom out here and look at the really big picture, I think we could kind of represent the situation, the human predicament in, in a schematic way like this. So suppose you draw on one axis here time. And on the y-axis there, some measure of technological capability, economic productivity. And the area here between these two dotted lines, this strip here, is what we think of as the human condition. And um, throughout human history, we have our civilization has been somewhere in this band here, and, and we've kind of climbed within that band a little bit over time. Um, but if we think about the long-term possible outcomes for our Earth-originating uh, intelligent civilization, it doesn't look like this is a stable state. Like, um, sooner or later, and the probability here increases the longer the time scale we are considering, I think we will exit this human condition. And, and that, that could basically happen in, in one or two ways. One, we could exit it in the downwards direction, where you have kind of in population biology this notion of a minimum viable population size. So if you have few, too few elephants left, like they go extinct because they don't have uh, enough, enough genetic diversity and stuff. And similarly with humans, there's like some minimum amount of um, economic productivity that you need to sustain a human population. So if we fall below that, then the longer term outcome there is very predictable because you go extinct and that's an attractor state. Like once you are extinct, you can stay extinct for a very long time. So this is like a final possible bucket we could end up with that, that is stable, where we could then remain for millions or, or billions of years, like our civilization could end. But I think there is also this other direction in which we could exit the human condition, as it were, the upwards uh, direction, where also I think there is an attractor state, which is a state such that if you get near it, you tend to fall into it and then stay there. Um, and that is if we exit it in the upwards direction here, suppose we developed a technological maturity, um, which might happen relatively quickly after superintelligence, given that the further technological development would then happen at digital timescales. So suppose, although I think there are these various risks associated with that transition, but suppose it goes well, then you have this technologically mature civilization that has already developed um, all the technologies that could pose big risks, and it has survived them. It has the technology to start spreading through the universe through automated uh, self-replicating robotic probes to set up more and more civilizations. At that point, it just becomes a lot harder to um, imagine some catastrophe that could destroy the entire civilization. So if you do make it through this upper dotted line there, then it might well be that at that point, again, the long-term fate of civilization becomes very predictable. Just to continue to expand as a bubble at some significant fraction of the speed of light for millions and, and billions of years in all directions. Um, and ultimately uh, and grab most of the cosmic endowment, the, the part of the universe that is in principle accessible for a civilization that starts on Earth at the current time. It's a big, big bubble. It's finite bubble because the universe is expanding. So things that are too far away, we can never reach. Like by the time we get halfway, space will have expanded by more than the distance we covered. So there is, there is a kind of ultimate horizon to what we can reach. But one attractive state is, I think, if we do exit the human condition in its upward direction, then we might be a sort of safe for billions of years and have a very long outcome. So, so, and, but I think that in that scenario, 
it, it, it seems to me a little bit of a strain to think that that, that whole future will be, be filled with bipedal, featherless creatures like us hopping around with three pounds cheese matter to think with, uh, living for 70 years and kind of trying to make ourselves happy by moving objects around in the external world. And the, so that, that, it, it seems that that probably would be associated with using some of this technology to maybe also rebuild or remodel um, the, the human uh, subject as well, like changing our own minds or, or doing, taking more direct control. There's a huge space of post-human possibilities there. But, um, but, but uh, yeah, the future could be very large. So I just want to sort of summarize. Um, I think that um, um, at some point, unless civilization somehow is destroyed prematurely, we will figure out how to craft algorithms that have the same um, general powerful ability to learn from sensory input that humans have and, and to develop long-range planning. And, and that, that general intelligence can then be used to solve all kinds of other problems that have purely intellectual solutions. They don't, they don't necessarily bring peace to the world, but if there's like a technological problem, they can figure out how to invent that technology. Um, we don't know how long this will take. We should just acknowledge that we don't know how long this could take. Um, it seems not that implausible that it could happen within the lifetime of some people alive today. Um, in order for that to happen, um, there are various really challenging problems that need to be solved to make current AIs smarter. We need more efficient learning algorithms, one-shot learning, like we humans can often learn by just being told something once or looking at one example, uh, whereas a lot of the time these current neural networks need thousands and thousands of examples. Uh, you need better unsupervised learning uh, that is learning where you don't have the label attached. We can just learn from sort of roaming around in the world and gradually pick up on things. Uh, transfer learning, um, which is the ability to use the, the learning, the representations, the insights you get from working in one domain and then apply them to a different domain. And there are limited ways of doing that. You can have an algorithm that after it has learned to play Breakout and Pac-Man can learn to become better at other computer games it hasn't yet seen, but it needs to become a lot more powerful. Uh, reasoning, I mentioned, we really need to develop maybe on top of these deep learning systems and reinforcement learning algorithms, more, more, much more flexible ways for doing reasoning. Uh, attention structures and so forth, natural language understanding needs to be built on that, um, and, and a few other things. So, so these things uh, need to be solved. They are big problems, but there are now thousands uh, and thousands of really, really smart people working on them and billions of dollars per year being spent on it. Um, but I think that, and this is really my final point, that in parallel with those really important technical challenges, there are some other challenges as well. Uh, if we want to make sure that the the, the impact of solving the first set of challenges is to be positive, which is, first and foremost, we need to solve this superintelligence control problem. And we need to have a solution in hand, ideally, before we figure out how to build superintelligence. Like, we don't want to figure out how to make machines superintelligent today, and then we figure out, ah, how we we'll control it. Well, let's start a research program, and maybe 20 years from now, we'll find out the answer. Like, that's not going to work. Um, um, there are various other things I haven't had time to talk, but in terms of technology racing dynamics. You could imagine a situation where, where the world is getting close to develop human-level AI. There are enormous incentives to try to get there first and make faster progress. So how could you, if, if implementing solutions to the control problem slows your project down, or if it takes a little bit of performance out of your system, like how could you coordinate to ensure that it gets implemented? There's, uh, you know, if, if these things um, become sufficiently um, capable and versatile. At some point, we need to think about whether they have moral status, just like we think, for example, animals have. Uh, then, if, if this control problem is, is, is solved, like, and this delivers vast wealth and benefits, how can we make sure that that's like, distributed in some reasonably fair way? Um, and, and how can we ensure that the world, once it has developed this extremely powerful general purpose technology, can then continue in a cooperative way and in a stable way to, towards realizing this uh, potentially enormous long-term uh, potential future for humanity. Um, so what, to come back to where I started, like what we're trying to do in, in my research group is to try to bring more attention to these and try to get those research fields started. And it's happened now in the last couple of years with the superintelligent control problem, but there are now a number of research groups around the world springing up doing that. Um, but we are still at an earlier stage with regard to these policy questions. So we're going to try to push hard on those. Thank you very much.
Excellent. Thank you, Nick. So I think we have some time now for Q&A, and I'd really like you to take advantage of this opportunity because I have a feeling that Nick's work is going to continue to grow in importance and influence, and maybe one day you'll be able to say, I heard him talk once. I asked him a question. So, and we haven't had as much interactivity today as I would have loved. So we've got some microphones, I believe. Do we have runners and riders? Melvin, who better? Um, let's go. Questions for Nick. Fire at him. Come on. Thank you. Yes, and then yes. Let's go. Come on, Melvin, move. OK. I heard recently, I'm very interested in this idea about the paper clips and this idea that if you tell AI to just create paper clips, we'll end up in a world of paper clips. So what would um, sort of stop that happening? Would it be sowing the seeds of doubt or programming doubt into um, the AI? Um, so that the human ultimately could sort of deflect it and turn it off? I mean, I'm just interested in your take on sowing the seeds of doubt in AI. So, so, so we don't yet know the answer, um, which is why research is now being conducted to try to find an answer. There are different ideas for how you might go about looking for a, a, a solution to that. Um, so one idea is to um, try to, in, instead of sort of defining an objective function ourselves by writing down a long list of everything we care about and all the right trade-offs. In, instead of doing that, to try to leverage this system's own intelligence to learn what it is that we value and what our intentions are. Um, and then to design it in such a way that it is motivated to pursue uh, our goals according to its gradually improving ability to understand what our goals are. Um, now, that involves some technical difficulties that we don't yet quite know how to do, but if you could get that to work, then you have potentially a scalable control method so that if the system is set up in such a way that it actually wants to do what you want to do and it, as it gets smarter, gets better and better at figuring out what you want, then in a sense, the, the more intelligent it is, the safer it is because it just is less likely to make a mistake in that. Um, Another line of attack, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, is to try to figure out how to engineer a motivation system that would be indifferent to being shut off. So that if you have an off switch button, the agent that you build wouldn't have an incentive to try to prevent you from pressing it. What you get by default is an agent like the paperclip maximizer that, that would have an instrumental reason to try to prevent you from pressing the button, either by like, pretending to you that everything is well and going according to your plan until it's strong enough not to bother, or by sort of physically disabling. Because it knows that if you press the off switch button, there will be fewer paperclips. So you, you tend to get resistance to off switch as a sort of side effect of most goals. But maybe it's possible to design cleverly some particular goals so that it's exactly indifferent. Um, you could. Um, try to have capability control methods. That is, rather than figuring out and changing what goes on inside the edit, you could try to put it in a box, like a virtual uh, environment, and then you unplug the Ethernet cable, and maybe you put a Faraday cage around the whole thing, and limit its ability to interact with the world, and maybe that would make it safer. Um, although it seems to me that that might at best be a useful extra precaution during the development stage. It's not like the final solution to this, because ultimately, I think, if, if you have the super intelligent genie in, in a bottle, it will out. Uh, so, so ultimately, you want uh, uh, this, this AI system to be safe, even, if, even when it kind of escapes. Um, and, and there are a number of other lines of attack as well that, that it's still early days um, that, that, people are, um, that the people are working on. But, but the first step, even just to get the ability to make progress on this is to kind of understand some of the potential ways in which you might fail to solve the control problem. Then you can break them down into smaller problems. And, and then, as we have now, and I've had for maybe only two years, so technical research agendas on each of these. So, so there are now sort of subtopics of this that you could imagine assigning to a computer science uh, PhD student and hope to get some progress. So we've moved from, gee, you know, really powerful computers could be dangerous, seems like a big thing, to now there are detailed technical research agendas where, where people can write like papers with maths in them and, and start making progress. That sounds, that sounds great. I do love that we're considering how to deal with this existential threat with um, a model that involves paperclip. <laughs> That's good. 
It's profound. Giles, you had a question? I've got two. Uh, cool. One Can is... You, uh, and who's next? Be thinking. Uh, one I is around questions. jobs, Good. Nick. Yes. Um, what, what's your view on which kind of jobs in the near to midterm are going to start to disappear? And any, any kind of views to people in this room about where we should be kind of moving our still superior human-based intelligence towards? So kind of, you know, what should we be actively you know, doing. And then the other is the kind of the Fermi kind of paradox, a bit of the other end of the can we, spectrum. Can we do one? Because there are actually quite a few people with questions. Okay, but oh, I want to ask this question, okay. which is, because uh, it's bonkers. So you like, get one. Well, are we the first? So, you know, and if we're not the first, do you agree with Elon Musk and everybody else that we're in it, or, you know, the nutters that we're in a simulation? What's your view on, 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 on that? Because it feels like, like if this happens very quickly, then it feels like, what? it doesn't feel like we're the first to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I can start with the, the second yeah, one. Second um, one. Yeah, so the, uh, um, the, the Fermi paradox, does everybody know, like, so this is why we haven't seen any signs of extraterrestrial life, even though there are like billions of planets from which life, had it been there, would have been able to reach our planet by now. Our planet has been around for four and a half billion years. And, um, so, particularly if you think that with this AI transition, it would be very easy to sort of colonize not just the solar system, but, the, but everything that is physically reachable. Um, so yeah, we might, we, might, we might be the first in this, this, it might just be very improbable for any given planet to uh, spawn intelligent life. That's consistent with all we know, like the, just getting all the, the right amino acids to bump into one another in exactly the right way to make a simple replicator. Maybe that's like astronomically improbable. Um, and uh, if, if we're not the first, if, if life is common, and even if life is not common but rare, uh, you still have to consider this, uh, this simulation hypothesis. Yeah, and I have a whole lot, lot of things to say about that. I, I wrote this paper back in 2001 on that topic. Can you do the one-liner, like, or the three-liner on the simulation power? Uh, well, it does open up a whole can of worms okay. in its own right. <laughs> You can, uh, you can go and look it up if you want to, if you Google simulation argument. We're basically living in a simulation. Well, no, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it says that one of three possibilities is true, one of which is that, but there are two alternatives. Okay. And it doesn't tell us which of the three. Okay. <laughs> so we might be, or we might not. There, there is this constraint that narrows what you can coherently believe about the future of the world and your place in it. As a surprising constraint that okay. one of these three possibilities is true, each, each okay. of which is kind of surprising. All right, cool. Uh, there was a question here, and then more over here, and let's get, we've had two men, let's have a woman. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the presentation, very, uh, very interesting and inspiring, and the first thing I'm going to do is watch Space Odyssey 2001 again, um, which brings me to my question. Can AI develop into something that has emotions, a temper, um, and with that has a sort of non-rational responses at some point? Yeah, so it's an open question whether, I mean, I th certainly it can in the fullness of time, yeah. I mean, I don't think you need to have carbon atoms uh, in, inside a sort of cranium to have emotions. I, th I think it could be done in principle on other substrates as well. Now, it's an open question whether it will be on the path to artificial general intelligence, like whether it's a useful um, way to obtain human level performance. Um, it might be that we humans use emotions because we kind of were built upon uh, simpler animals that used more emotional processes. The, lim the limbic system is kind of very old part that we share with lizards and other animals, right? And then the kind of the abstract thinking is kind of layered on top of that. So it might be that if you're building this from scratch, you might not have that legacy um, software in there. You might, you might get to sort of the end point. If, if what you want to do in particular is to have an AI that can make better AIs, then it might or might not go via emotions. Um, a lot of human emotions are also about um, kind of making sure that, that we behave, that to, to motivate us to behave in a way that would have been adaptive in the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. Um, so 
it's not only about allowing us to sort of model the world better and think more accurately, but it's also about sort of driving our behavior to do the things that um, that would have been. And so, if with an with an AI, like if, if it has a different objective function, like to make paper clips, it, it might not need to feel sort of jealousy and pride and all kinds of other emotions. Now, there is a sense of non-rational thinking, which I think is necessary and which AIs will have, and in fact already have very limited ways of, and that's intuition. That is things you can sort of explicitly represent and, and know logically how they work. So these image recognition uh, software have a kind of simple visual intuition. The uh, AlphaGo system that plays Go has visual intuition in the sense that it can look at the board game. It can sort of see patterns there and, 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 and have a sense for where it seems like a promising place to place a stone is. What it can't do is think through all the possible places and play out the whole tree and think logically through it. It does a little bit of logic on top of it, but you need the visual intuition to get that to work at all. So, so that kind of uh, intuitive judgment yeah. part of emotion, that certainly will be part of it. Yeah, my understanding from the Go game was that at one point the air played a move that was kind of unprecedented and felt, felt Yeah, felt yeah, no, intuitive. So, and, and there has been more since, so that the, these human Go champions are now pouring over um, the, the games of AlphaGo, they're and learning. they're discovering completely new strategies, right. ways of playing Go that, that, that they can learn from now on. That's scary. I also love hearing you talk about humans. It's, it's amazing. You talk about humans of carbon and like bipedal, featherless creatures carrying around a three-pound lump of cheese in their head. Well, <laughs> it's great. It's, helps. It's, it's putting me in my place. It's great. Um, Do we have a question over here somewhere? Jason in a second. Jake, let's go. Yes, I wanted a female voice, and then let's do Jason, and let's do you, and then we'll shift gears into the next session. I actually wanted to go back to Giles' first question, and in the near term, um, what percentage of the human workforce do you see being completely irrelevant in the next 10 to 15 years based on artificial intelligence? Okay, so that, that gives me an excuse as well to maybe answer your first question. Um, so I, I think there's some hype as to the current impact of AI. I, I, I'm not convinced that kind of the unemployment problems we have today are really an, in any significant way caused by this progress in, in AI. Um, and one shouldn't like, underestimate how long it will take to, so if, if you think of a human job, so, so it's one thing to have an AI that can do a particular task as well as human. But a lot of jobs involve many different tasks. And to, to fully replace the human worker, you'd have to sort of have the AI being able to do all of those different tasks that need to be bundled together. Um, and so in many cases, that uh, is, is, is a lot longer. I mean, if, if you look at things where there might be midterm impacts, I think uh, self-driving cars is an obvious one. That's like, it's a fairly big, um, big job category. Um, but again, that's going to take time. I mean, first you have to develop, perfect the technology enough, and then you have to get regulatory approval, and then you have to start replacing the existing car fleet, um, which, I mean, there's like 20 years worth of production uh, just on the roads. Like, it's going to take a while for that to be replaced with self-driving cars unless you can easily retrofit. So if you add all of that up, like, it's, it's, it's going to take a while before it starts having a big impact. Um, Amazon is, is playing around with these uh, different uh, groceries where there are no, like, no humans. You have video cameras everywhere and other sensors that can just look at you as you go around and putting things in your shopping basket and then it just sees what you have bought and automatically charges it to your account. I guess you need a security guard at, at the exit, but not that, if, if that works, that, that could kind of start cut down on, on, on the retail sector. Um, but you might see a bigger impact sooner just by like, the impact of, of Amazon's online store, which might push out kind of shopping malls and, and other retailers. And that, that it does involve AI, yes. I mean, you have the product recommendation system and fraud detection system and other things and inventory management. Um, but that, th that doesn't require any additional breakthroughs in AI. That's just kind of applying techniques that already exist and have existed. Um, so in the long term, everything that humans do, unless humans for some reason specifically value the job being done by a human, so there are some categories where, where you know, maybe like athletes or something like that, even, even if a robot could run faster, right? We might still prefer to watch a human or, or, or priest or judge or politician or something where we decide it has to be done by human. Then those roles might forever kind of be okay. out of the reach. So we all need to become athletes, priests. Well, what was the other one? Judges. If, 
if, if, if, if, if your plan is to make a living by continuing to sell your labor in, in, in this future. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, that's if you want a job. But if you don't want a job. If you don't want a job. No, and, and for most people, presumably, uh, it cool. might not make sense to think of this. OK. Um, let's, let's do another question, because time is running out. Right. Jason. Hey, so I want to, uh, over here. Oh. Over here, that doesn't there you help. Go. Right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to put you on the spot. So you mentioned AlphaGo. You've got Watson. You mentioned Amazon. Um, they're all fundamentally different approaches to artificial intelligence. Which one wins? And I, and I hope it's not Netflix. Which one wins? Well, so right now, the field of AI research is, is very, very open. So there's really this common pool of knowledge to which all these different groups, as well as people in academia, are contributing. Like they are rushing to publish their papers, to present at these technical conferences. Uh, more than that, uh, they share big platforms that make it easier for other researchers to test their results. And so at, at the moment, it's really done in the, the way that basic research is done in academia. Like you, you, what your goal is to get the boasting rights from having invented something. Um, if that scenario continues, then it's really hard for the front runner to get much ahead of the pack because everybody basically has the same ideas. In that scenario, therefore, the differentiator might be access to compute so that if everybody has basically the same algorithms, then the one with the most compute power may be facilitated with data, but I think mostly compute would win. So that, that would be either, either people who can buy up a lot of compute quickly or expropriate a lot of compute, like governments might, or companies that already have a lot of compute, like Google or Amazon or other cloud service provider. Uh, but it might well be that at some point this AI development paradigm shifts to a more closed paradigm. Um, and then, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's fairly clear who the current sort of biggest leading groups are. That if, if this is going to take 20, 30, 40 years, that obviously there might be new entrants. But right now, I'd say that Google is uh, the leader. They have actually two, two separate basic AI research teams, like one in the Valley, the Google Brain, and then another one in London, DeepMind, each of which is arguably among the top two. Um, but there are also strong groups at Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Baidu, uh, and others, and academic uh, places as well. Toronto, Montreal, Stanford, Berkeley. Brilliant. Good. I know there are more questions, but we're actually going to have to wrap it there. So can we